Good morning to one and all present here. It's an absolute pleasure to have amongst us Mr. Vikash Shinde, Director HR ADP. The phenomenal personality has had a progressive career in multicultural and matrix environment. Formerly, he has had a diverse experience across various industries and worked with companies like John Deere, Accenture, Oracle, Putney Computer Systems, and iGate. He has been an epitome of success in the industry for the last 15 years by the virtue of his functional skills and specialization in the field of HR. His expertise areas include strategy formulation and execution, compensation and benefits, recruitment across technologies and industries, employee engagement initiatives, and HR operations. Throwing light on his educational background, he has done his BCom from Symbiosis School of Arts and Commerce and pursued MBA in HR from Symbiosis Institute of Management Studies. Now, I would request Mr. Shinde to kindly share his words of wisdom with us. Sir, the dais is all yours. Morning. You know, this being the third day, uh, there are a few things that you should know. One, it's highly unlikely that you would hear something new from me. Uh, you would have already, uh, everything that I have to say would have probably been said already. I'll try and make it as interesting as I can. <clears throat> the second thing is that I'd like to apologize right up front. Uh, apologies uh, for the emerging challenges in the future um, from where we stand today may not look very uh, may look a little bleak so let me let me just apologize but the beauty is that uh, in in that bleakness lies opportunity for all of us right uh, and and, I, my, and my my hope really is that you are able to see that opportunity and not necessarily the the bleakness uh, that i'm trying to project which 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 is the stark reality today Okay. Um, uh, that being said, uh, I just have three slides, you know, in, including this, you know, excluding this one. I, I've got total four slides. So uh, this talk is going to be uh, helpful only if you participate. Um, I know that uh, you know there's a there's a there's some time schedule right at the end for question and answers, but I would really really appreciate if you can ask questions as I move along because that's that's how uh, you know that's how we'll all kind of leverage this session more. I have, like I said, I have three slides. Uh, the first one will generally talk about what's the business and the, uh, the economic challenges of the, of the foreseeable future. And when I talk about future, I am looking at you five years from now. All of you student managers who would possibly, you know, enter organizations and in five years reach a level where you will all be, uh, you know, required to take and make people-based decisions. You know, you will you will reach a position in your careers where people will look up to you to make the right choice, and that's the future that I am. You know, I, I would want you to. I'm not necessarily immediately after you graduate, but after about five years, when you would be, uh, you know, you you would be seen uh, and expected to guide the others in the organization towards towards what you think is is the right thing, right? So that's how. Uh, so these are these are, these are few of the. Um, what do you say? I just want to kind of get these away. These are some assumptions before the talk. But um, how many of you, uh, how many of you have heard the term VUCA? Yes, I was guessing almost. I'm surprised that some hands are not uh, not raised. Can you can you keep them raised, please? How many of you heard VUCA? I can understand if the last row, which I have been told is the BBA, if they haven't heard, but. But otherwise, yeah, and, and being in the third day of a, of a seminar which is talking about future challenges, I expect you to know VUCA. But VUCA is not something new. And, and for those who don't know, VUCA is uh, uh, a, a term which was coined by, uh, you know, somebody, you know, who just wanted to kind of share with us what the world is going to look like. The world is going to be volatile, it's going to be uncertain, ambiguous, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's what VUCA really stands for. And, and, and in all of this, you know, something really, uh, something very simple that's hidden, which is, it's nothing new. It's nothing new that the world is changing. The world's always been changing, right? It's part of the evolution, uh, you know, the business evolution. You know, we, we have moved from strength to strength, and, and the world has been changing, but the rate of change is something that's absolutely scary now. So anybody who comes here and, and, and uh, you know, is trying to tell you, uh, you know, what the, what the future is going to look like, you know, how challenging it is, he's doing so because the rate of change uh, is, is, is really, really bothering them. And the rate of change bothers us as well in the, in the business environment, and it should bother you as well. Um, you've, you've heard of Moore's Law? Has, has everybody heard of Moore's Law? Yeah. 
So has anybody else heard of the Moore's law? So Moore's law was, uh, you know, was something that was, uh, uh, you know, that is applicable to the computing power of, of, uh, of the integrated chips. And Moore said that at, in every 18 to 20 months, the ability of the integrated circuit to compute doubles every 18 to, 18 to 20 months. And that kind of ended, you know, we've reached for the, for the computing power, at least we've reached. But there's a new Moore's law that's there. And, and you know, and, and it is leading us towards singularity. And that is on AI, right? New Moore's law is talking about AI. AI had taken a back seat when, when the focus was really on computing, but now AI is coming to the forefront. And, and AI is going to double its capacity to, to uh, you know, to wow us every 15 to 18 months. And that's the new Moore's law. Okay, so with that, let me just, uh, you know, let me just, you know, talk you through, through my first slide. Um, like I said, I just have three slides. First, we'll talk about, you know, what the business, business environment and, and the economic environment is going to be in the future. Uh, nobody knows for sure. Uh, you know, we're just looking at the past data in the present, trying to predict future. Uh, the, you know, with almost, uh, you know, uh, with, with about 50% predictability. We will also then talk about what those business challenges mean for the HR world. You know, how is it that, uh, you know, we are, you know, our responsibility is to redefine people capabilities by increasing productivity, by more engagement in this unpredictable world. So what is it that, what kind of business challenges, what kind of HR challenges do we see? That's slide number third. And then, and the, and the last slide really is, what are the solutions that we, uh, that we foresee? What is it that, uh, you know, how can we overcome those challenges, right? Does that sound good? Is there anything else that you would like from me? Raise your hands. Okay, if, if that's what you're really looking at, then, then let's, let's begin. Uh, you know, there are, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of people would have spoken to you about this, uh, about what are those business and economic challenges that we foresee in the future. Plenty. Uh, you know, we are looking at a huge uh, underemployment or uh, even unemployment that can possibly hit, uh, largely because of the advent of robotics uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the workspace. We're talking about AI replacing uh, humans, and that, what, what that will lead to in a, in a very consolidated fashion is uh, underemployment. Uh, people will have to reskill, and that's, that's a near foreseeable future. And uh, with a lot of degree of certainty, we can tell you that that is definitely going to happen. So if you are holding your skills very dear to you, uh, then you might want to rethink. You might want to you might want to rethink how is it that you will reskill yourself. I think reskilling will be uh, those people who are able to reskill themselves faster, quicker, uh, and uh, will be more relevant in the industry. People who who think that you know what uh, I'm a specialist and I'm going to stick to my um, you know stick to my profession. I think those are the ones who are going to be in grave danger. Uh, and grave being the operating word because you you will suddenly see that there are there is a there is a AI or there is a bot that is able to do the, your work you know, 10 times faster and 20 times better and 30 times God knows what. So if my suggestion to you and first and foremost, right off the bat is please don't, uh, you know, don't be afraid of reskilling yourself. You might be doing a particular specialization today. Uh, you know, the job will demand that, you know, or, or you being in the workforce will demand you to reskill yourself uh, and be open to that idea. As long as you're open to that idea, I'm sure half the battle is done. You know, you've lost the battle if you, if you are very, very rigid about, you know, this is my specialization, I'm going to stick to it, right? Uh, not to mention, you know, some of the other things like energy and, you know, and climate and all of that, but AI and robotics, uh, underemployment, uh, the failure of financial systems, and, and if there's anything that 2008, 2009 has taught us is, is that how, you know, we, how networked the world really is, right? A system failure in, in one part of the world can have a devastating impact on the others. Uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have read, but uh, you know, the, the Japanese function, pension fund lost about $52 billion, uh, you know, when, when, a, when recently something happened in China. Uh, the Japanese pension fund, when people, people who had put their hard-earned money lost $52 billion. You might want to go and read about it. But that's, that's how interconnected we are. If there is a, something that happens in, in Australia has an impact in, in Finland. If something happens in Finland, that has an impact in India, and that's the that's the bane of being so uh, interconnected and globalized in a way. So that can go wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm here. You know, what we're try, really trying to list is the number of things that can potentially go wrong. I'm not saying that it, they will, but it's in order to be prepared for tomorrow. Let's try and see if we can have strategies built around you know uh, built around these challenges to say if something was to go wrong, what is it that we can do? Right? How is it that we can protect protect the interest of our organization should these factors 
you know either one of them or all all of them together or a combination of these go wrong and which they will which they will if there's anything that is uh, that we know from past is that some of these factors will happen there is going to be uh, ai and robotics there is going to be underemployment there is going to be huge climate change there are going to be man made disasters right i mean these are things that we know for sure if not tomorrow then day after tomorrow they are going to happen and then how is it that we can prepare ourselves how organizations what are organizations doing today to prepare themselves for this eventuality okay very quickly uh, so polarized society you know I, and i was thinking about what is it that i should tell you what is it that what is really happening i mean without really the jargons what, what what's really happening in the society today and you'll realize that we are becoming less tolerant you know there's a, the society is getting polarized either in in binary either you favor or you or you don't favor people are not uh, you know driving the middle path these days you know everybody is so opinionated and they are either either uh, either on the side of uh, a or on the side of b there are no uh, you know there, there are no moderate uh, temperament and moderate opinion these days people are fairly opinionated and that's that's driving a different behavioral culture altogether people are extremely polarized uh, do you agree i mean you read the papers and you are you know you know starting from uh, you know starting from a simple thing to a large and uh, you know thing like religion people are fairly polarized in this society and what that really does is that it uh, you know it jeopardizes uh, you know you, the peace uh, of of a particular region now you know about arab upspringing you know qatar uh, underwent a huge thing qatar airways was boycotted by by neighboring uh, you know neighboring countries and therefore it went through a huge it's still going through a big challenge and all of this has a has a huge impact right uh energy infrastructure income wealth and uh, and inequalities i you know i don't know how many of you have known but this is going to be a big problem for uh, for us uh, there is a bludgeoning um, you know the middle income group people richer people are getting richer the poor are getting poor the the inequalities are increasing and and it is very stark in a country like ours odesk is a platform and odesk uh, you know revenues grew up by almost 200% in the last one year what is it, what is odesk and i would really i would have appreciated if some more hands went up you have to be uh, odesk is a platform which brings work and people who uh, with capabilities together it's like the amazon for for workforce so odesk revenues like i said grew up by almost 200% and what does uh, you know why why is odesk so successful odesk is successful because people are getting into the mindset, the mindset of liquid workforce you know i don't have to necessarily work for adp i can sell my skills to multiple companies i can work in you know in the morning 2 hours for infosys in the afternoon i can work for 3 hours 3 uh, hours for for john deere and the evening i can work for 2 hours for adp on project based project based work so that i'm able to give my skills uh, i can live my life the way i want i can you know have the flexibility to work anytime not work uh, you know whenever i don't want to i take a vacation anytime that i want i can charge people for for the work that i do um, you know i not be bothered by promotions and you know and you know going to the office at, from 9 to 5 then worrying about office politics and so on and so forth i can be at my home you know if it is abilities that count and if it is the abilities that uh, that get paid then you know i could be i i should be willing to work for anybody and that's the whole concept of odesk right and you will you will see that more and more people are willing to do that people are willing to take that charge this is this is a huge mind shift mind uh, mindset change i don't know how many of you were earlier uh, at least in my generation i can talk about so when i got an offer from accenture i called up my dad and he's in the army he's he's always been in the army he was in, retired after 38 years of service but when i called him up and i said papa i got through accenture and his first remark was kyun uh, infosys wagara mein nahi ho sakta tumhara and i had to you know spend some time to tell him that you know what accenture is much bigger than bigger than infosys and you know twice the revenue three times whatever this that but the whole point is that you know th that was his mindset i mean he would he would you know he would say that you know once you join a company you stay there till till retirement and you know he is extremely disappointed in me that i've already changed six companies and with, with, within my 15 16 years so for him i am not doing very well but the point is that you know i i just can't even imagine having a conversation with him to say that i'm i've turned liquid which means that i i work for one company in the morning one company in the evening i think he'll just hit the roof i don't know what his reaction will be ki to bilkul hil gaye ho but that's besides the point but that's that's a huge uh, you know mindset mindset why why is it, I'm, i'm having difficulty saying mind, mindset 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 but that's a big mindset change that's going to happen in the future uh, on demand hr uh, i want to talk about I, in fact i want to talk about all of these because they're very dear to me and these are the hr challenges right and and you are going to so you you might think that you are specializing in finance or or marketing or or operations but all of these challenges are going to be so closer home that you will be surprised 
there is something called as massively open uh, online courses. How many of you have heard of MOOC? Oh yeah, I'm glad. So what is MOOC doing? MOOC uh, is is uh, what is it? So what is MOOC doing? MOOC is uh, you know completely revolutionizing the way learning and development happens in organizations. Now, earlier what used to happen is that learning and development in your organization used to be uh, you used to be the employer's prerogative. Or that's what the employees really thought. Mujhe kisi ne training ke liye nominate nahi kiya, mere friend ko kar diya. So you would you would have that against the organization. Uh, you would always depend on the organization to pick up and nominate you for a training, right? No longer that case. The concept of learning and the concept of learnability both are undergoing a huge change. And you know who's responsible for that? Coursera, Khan Academy. Oh, what else? Yes. These are some of the uh, you know these are these are some of the things that are changing in HR. The traditional training and development organization or training and development function is undergoing a huge change. There's a huge pressure on them. You know how we move? We move from classroom courses to uh, to CBTs or computer-based trainings. Where you know at that time uh, you know ten years back that was the biggest fad that learning. Uh, at your own pace and so on and so forth. No longer, I mean, I'm, organizations are now, you know, pushing the envelope or pushing the responsibility of uh, of individual learning right back to the employee, saying that listen, you go ahead and you decide what's important for you. You you can go to any of these MOOC uh, uh, available resources and, and train yourself. Right? That's that's a that that's again is a is a mindset change. The other thing that I want to talk to you about is on demand HR. Uh, you know, people are wanting to. Uh, people are wanting. People don't want to wait for things. You know, people are talking about real-time feedback. Uh, in my days, and and, and and when I say in my days, I'm not really talking about 50, you know, 30 years back. I'm talking about five years back. I'm talking about as uh, four years back, really. Nobody was talking about real-time feedback. People used to have performance appraisals one time in a year, and your manager will observe you right through the year, and at the end of the year, he will give you a feedback how you were, you know, all throughout the year. And there were there were big time gaps in that whole process. You know, people would forget there would be a recency effect. How I have performed in the last quarter will will kind of uh, you know dominate my whole year's performance. If I have done mistake in the last month, you know that will spoil the good work that I have done in the past and so on and so forth. There were there were many such uh, you know challenges in the traditional performance management system. What is happening today? Today millennials are asking for for real time feedback. They want to, if I do something good, tell me now. If I do something bad, tell me now. Don't wait for a year. Don't don't wait for 12 months to tell me how I you know how I how I messed up 12 months back. That's not going to help. People are talking about uh, you know real time performance management. Not only real time feedback, but real time performance management. If I do something good, go to the system and please tell me that I've done good. And then go don't go and change it back because after some time maybe I did not do well. But two months back, the job that I did well will always be recorded that I you know kind of I excelled in that. So that's real time performance. So that's on demand HR. I'll tell you what, people are, there are companies that are now running payroll on demand. Do you know what is payroll on demand? On demand payroll? You can run, so if I want salary twice this month, I can run my own payroll. I can take two salaries in a month. And if I have, you know, lots of cash at hand and I want, you know, I don't want salaries for the next three months, I will not run my own payroll for three months. And then I can collectively take it at the end of the fourth month. That's on-demand payroll. And I, I come from a payroll company. I know how big a mindset change that is. And that's the on-demand nature of everybody is uh, on, on mobile these days. Uh, your leaves are getting approved on mobile. You're applying for leaves on mobile. Your learning and management, your learning management system, uh, system is mobile. So if you are in the cab coming from your home to the office, you all the mandatory courses, people are doing it on the, on, on the cell phone. That's on-demand HR. And maybe some of these things are, you know, have been already been spoken about. But there are not too many companies who have embraced all of this uh, even today. Okay. Uh, Work-life balance solutions, well-being. I don't need to you know talk about this. So, so what is this doing to you know? How is this a challenge? How how are all of these things a challenge? You know, in terms of attraction and uh, retention, companies have to rebuild their value proposition almost every six months. And I'll tell you how. I'll give you live examples of. So everybody understands employee value proposition. Yeah, what is it that you have for? So say if, if a candidate comes to you and say, "What is in it for me? Why should I join ADP?" The answer that ADP will give is their value proposition. Right? If I, if you go to a company uh, and if you have multiple offers, say, and I, hopefully all of you will, you know, 
uh, God willing, you will have more than two offers at the end of your, uh, you know, academic year. And you go and say, Infosys, why should I join you? And that answer that they give is their value proposition. And this value proposition, you know, companies used to have that value proposition for at least five years without changing it. Now, every six months, there has to be an addition or modification to that value proposition. Why? Because the business environment is changing so fast. Your competitors are changing so fast. There was a startup which, did, which was not there two years back, but that startup is, is almost going to kill your, kill your product. Right? And therefore, you have to redefine your value proposition. This has happened to us, ADP. Uh, so, uh, my office is in SP InfoCity in a place called Hadapsar. Um, and suddenly, Allstate came up. Allstate is a, is a uh, insurance in the US. A anybody has heard of Allstate insurance? You have? So, Allstate, when Allstate came up, um, they were looking at people who had sold insurance, people who had done customer service in insurance. Right? And ADP, who was, which was just right next door, became, a, became like a hunting ground for them. And we started losing people tremendously. So what that meant was, for our insurance business, we had to redefine our value proposition very quickly. And what are some of the things that we did? Of course, we kind of pegged them at a higher percentile when, when compensation came. You know, we, we said, okay, you take an extra day of leave. The night shift rotation became, we used to rotate people every six months uh, for night shift. We said, okay, six months is way too long. Every three months, you know, you just need to do night shift for three months. Then you will have three, three months of day shift. Then and we and this is redefining our uh, our value proposition value proposition uh, redefining of value proposition became an extremely important task and we started doing that for many other companies amazon came up has come up in pune every time a new competitor comes in pune you have to redefine your value proposition at least we have to redefine ours you know when you are in campus these days uh, you have to redefine your value proposition then also earlier there was a very set standard on campus and, and i'm talking about engineering uh, campuses really uh, you know, there used to be, uh, there used to be iBanks who came, who, consults who came there first, you know, for the analytics department. I don't know if you know, but McKenzie, BCG, Baines, Booz, Allen, Accenture, Deloitte, PwC, and all of these consulting companies came first. Then came the banks, then came the IT, IT, oh, no, then came the specialist, uh, you know, industries like Schlumberger. And then came IT, IT, ES industry, right? Now, I think things are absolutely different. Now, even if consulting companies go up front, it's not, uh, you know, it's not that everybody is wanting to sit for McKinsey or Baines or, or BCG. People will wait for their specialty companies to come in, to come in. I think that's a gradual shift that's really happening. And that's how, therefore, what does that mean? Even, you know, for earlier, you know, it used to be a really a funny thing that we used to, when, when uh, you know, I started my career and we used to joke that, can you imagine being a recruiter for McKinsey? Like, how easy would that be? You, know, you pick up the phone and say, I'm calling from McKinsey and somebody's shouting, sir, I want to join and, you know, whatever. You know, they would have no dropouts, no offer decline. McKinsey, who would not want to join McKinsey, right? But I'm guessing things are changing. Um, you know, people, it's not necessarily that the brightest student would want to sit for McKinsey. You know, he would possibly wait and, you know, look at uh, a, a job and, you know, look at the profile, evaluate that, look at what is the value proposition that the, the company is offering, look at long-term strategy of the company and then possibly join them. Um, so that's, that's a big change that's, that's happening in the, in the world today. Uh, global workforce integration, I want to spend some time here, I want to talk about talent mobility as well, uh, the one which is here in the uh, top of the uh, slide. What is really going to happen is, uh, is, is, is very exciting. You know, earlier, um, America was the only country that was exporting talent, right? Uh, in Dubai, if you went to Singapore, which were, you know, largely expat uh, friendly, you know, places to work, Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, you would see a lot of Americans. You would see Americans and then you will see Europeans. Uh, UK dominated within the Europeans also UK dominated but a lot of people from from uh, the United States because those were the only ones who had surplus of leadership talent that were willing to kind of exp I think that's going to change very quickly what what India is also going to do is that India is now in a position uh, because of the success of the some of the Indian pure play companies and the way we've been able to able, you know kind of contribute towards uh, the business in general uh, across industry segments that we will also be exporting talent. We will be exporting leadership talent to, to other countries. And that mobility of talent will also become a huge challenge for us. Uh, we will, there will be a huge trade-off of talent. Uh, now, uh, which, which, which necessarily means that, and, and I know that what I'm saying is largely going to go against what uh, Donald Trump is trying to do, which is, you know, trying to restrict uh, people coming into the country and so on and so forth. But I think uh, it's just one of those cases. I'm, I'm very, very certain that going forward, um, it is this exchange of talent 
uh, that is going to be beneficial for everybody. Nor, it's not going to be only US that's going to be exporting leadership talent across, I think, countries like India, Brazil, not to mention China, Russia, and all of these, uh, you know, other BRIC countries that are going to uh, export leadership talent outside. Uh, and you, and it's pretty evident, right? I mean, and of course, you know, in the larger scheme of things, these are outliers, but Google, you know, has an India CEO, Pepsi, Indra Nui has been there for a long time and so on and so forth. But I think even in smaller companies, you will see that uh, our talent uh, and, and, and the mobility and the readiness of our talent to go and take leadership positions is something going to be really, really exciting and something to watch out for. Uh, all hierarchy, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this, is, this is changing and this is changing really fast. Uh, earlier, what used to happen is that the higher you go, greater your responsibility and higher your salary. Right? I mean, if you if you look at a pyramid, a standard pyramid, you start off. Uh, now, this pyramid is itself is uh, uh, getting questioned, right? I mean, the whole org, the concept of having an organization pyramid is being questioned. You will have experts who will get more salary than their managers, and it's happening today. I'm I'm talking about, uh, you know, it might seem a little, uh, uh, what do you say, far fetched for you, but it's happening today. You have a team of five members, and have you all heard of agile squads? Yeah, so these are commando teams that that uh, you know that companies are setting up. These are extremely empowered teams, uh, which have uh, you know uh, somebody from user experience. People have a, a product development guy. You have an HR. You have a, somebody from finance, uh, and you know they club. They, these are called agile squads, and th this is the whole concept of you know making pods as well. You pick and you know pick that team. And, and 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 kind of inject into a team so that they can give the necessary impetus to that, and then they move on to a different team and all of, or, or, you know or, or, you know just kind of help the other team also grow. Um, so what that is doing is that it is challenging the organization design and organization hierarchy. No longer you know uh, is the hierarchy uh, you know the way we understand it. It's not going to be pyramid any longer. You know there will be one guy in Romania, there will be one guy uh, you know sitting in in. Uh, in Brazil, there will be one in, in Hong Kong and two in Bangalore and uh, you will never know who is the manager, you will not know who is the, you know, who is earning more. Today what happens, by designation you will come to know who earns more, but that's not, uh, you know, that's not how we foresee that the world is going to be five years from now. You will not be, because skills and abilities will demand more, not necessarily, you know, rank and hierarchy and all of that will possibly become obsolete by the time you come into uh, you know, by, by the time you spend about five, eight years in the in the corporate uh, world, I I am guessing, you know, and my best bet is that all of these things will start getting obsolete very quickly. So, you know, somebody who is uh, really, really, uh, you know, a tech architect of the of the project will possibly be getting the most amount of money. The manager will possibly just be the scribe who will be keeping notes of the, uh, you know, of of uh, of what the meeting is meeting is all about and so on and so forth. So I think that's, that change is, uh, is, is pretty evident today. It's already starting, uh, you know, it's taking shape. Every organization is calling for org redesign meetings. You know, this, this particular org structure, the one that HR has given us, which has been there for the last 10 years, is not working for us. We want a different org structure. We want tech leads to be, you know, ahead of the managers and so on and so forth. And we are entertaining those kind of conversations because we know, uh, you know, the traditional org structure in a very conventional way, is restricting the growth of the team, right? Any, any questions so far? Let me take a quick pause and try and see if there are any questions. Yes, please. Sir, how do you think, as you were talking about disparity of income, so uh, what do you think the implementation of GST uh, will uh, have an effect on the employer-employee transactions, as in uh, whatever uh, was given previously, uh, free cab facility, free food. So any gifts that uh, usually were given to the employees, the uh, up, above fifty thousand would be becoming taxable. Yes, so would yes. impact. You know, I don't. I don't think. Uh, you know, at least I, in, in in some of the organizations that I have friends or in my own organization, that's not making a huge difference at this point in time. You know, we are uh, our benefit programs continue to remain the same, uh, and largely our benefit programs have always been on health and wellness. Right. I mean, we are talking about. Uh, group medical insurance, we're talking about group life insurance, group, uh, you know, personal accident insurance and all of that. Uh, so we aren't, we weren't anyways giving, uh, you know, perquisite gifts like you say. Uh, anyways, that had come down to a significantly large level. You know, only the very, um, um, you know, top of the, like for example, GMs and, and senior vice presidents are, were getting some of these club memberships and so on and so forth, which anyways was, you know, coming down. But to the large population set, our benefits were revolving around their well-being, which is not getting really impacted. So, so, good question, but I don't see any impact, at least from a 
from an affordability of benefit and extension of benefit to the uh, to to the larger employee base, there isn't a change at this point in time. Morning, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is Priyank Bhardwa. I'm from the marketing batch, PIMM. Uh, sir, as uh, you are the part of the CSR department also, I just I was more expecting you to enlighten us with the changes in the CSR as well. Okay. So, is it still the obligatory function that the company is trying to look upon it, or is it it has also evolved and changed over the years? I think uh, great question. Uh, there's a definite my, you know mind shift mind shift that's happening. Um, Primarily because in 2013, I don't know how many of you know, but there's a Companies Act, uh, you know, came out with a, uh, with, a yeah, with a ruling that, you know, 2% of the, so since then, everybody has, you know, kind of whether they like it, or, you can sit down, you know, whether they like it or not, whether it's coming from a right place in the sense that, you know, whether their heart is in it or not, they have to do it. Um, but I think more and more companies are realizing that they have to pay a part in the society. Uh, you know, what is really happening within the NGO space as well. And you will notice is that the, since the time that corporate India has come into the NGO space, it is being driven with, uh, with a focus, slightly more focus. And NGOs, for all the good intentions that they had, they did not have a focus on, uh, on return on investment, right? They were not driven by matrix. They did not know that for every 100 rupees spent, how much was, uh, you know, what was being achieved for that 100 rupees. But since the time corporate India has gotten into the not for profit, profit sector because they are the one who are kind of, you know, funding. And, for, you know, I don't know how many of you know the Reliance, how much of money do they pump into the, you know, NGO sector? 680 crores a year. That's huge, right? I mean, 680 crores is only, only Reliance pumps in into their, uh, into their charitable trust every year and that's a big amount of money so every time a company puts in this kind of a money they are expecting all the ngos to 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 have greater control over their spend they should be able to tell us what is that they're doing with the money um, so that is a, a big discipline change that is happening in the ngos that's largely because of how companies are operating within the ngo space or within the charitable uh, space so that's a good question i think uh, there is a uh, there's a change that is happening there's a change that is happening for the good Earlier, not-for-profit organizations, while they were doing good, they did not have the expertise of corporate, uh, you know, infrastructure that they could come and tell us, maintain these kind of, uh, you know, uh, like for example, I, I let me talk about ADP. What is it that we've done is that we, we used to work with 10 different NGOs. And these NGOs will come and they will, you know, say, sir, acha kaam chal rahe. And, uh, you know, then suddenly we started asking, acha kaam ka matlab kya hai? Then can you please tell us how many students were you able to touch yeah, under the education program? What were, what were their grades beginning of the year? What were the grades end of the year? And this, these kind of things they were not measuring. And now because of, you know, corporate India has, you know, kind of uh, seeped into the workings of NGO, they are also coming up with new matrices to say, sir, the health, the, last year, uh, you know, 15 students fell ill due to dengue, 20 students got malaria, but this year only 5 students have missed their school because of that. And that's the kind of shift that we want to kind of, you know, into get into. So that's, that's more or less to quickly answer your question. Yes. So does that add up to the brand image of uh, the company as well? And are they doing it for that purpose only? No, no. I, I think it would be really unfair for, uh, you know, to, for, for anybody to say that people are spending 500 crore and everything for just for brand image because a company that can, you know, spend 500, uh, you know, crores only on charity, I'm sure has a bigger budget for, for creating their own brand. So I, I don't think that people are, you know, just waiting for that 2% spend uh, to build a brand. I think people are, uh, you know, people want to build a brand outside of what they're doing for charity. A lot of the organizations that I know and people who are within the CSR space uh, want to do that even anonymously, right? I mean, that's the whole point. You, you, when you do good, you don't need to be tom toming about it. Organizations are not really focused on that. Yes, of course, if you're, uh, you know, inaugurating a school, do you want your logo to be there? Maybe yes. But that's only about it. I mean, we don't, I don't think companies are, you know, wanting to leverage some, uh, you know, brand recall from that particular activity now. You know, they have got, they have got uh, their own stuff that they do good, which will uh, eventually come out. Thanks, thanks for the question. So, uh, here's, uh, here's what, uh, you know, I want to kind of end my, uh, this is my last slide really. And so, I, I'm going to take about 5-10 minutes trying to explain to you what are some of the solutions that are coming out. Um, needless to, uh, you know, mention, I, I, like I was talking to you about robotics and I was talking to you about AI and uh, you know everything else that is uh, that is smart these days I was uh, you know in an in a HR tech conference just about a month back uh, in Delhi and uh, there was a speaker who was talking about uh, you know his experience in in a, in a European country and he had gone to a similar uh, you know sim similar conference there and a startup was pitching up their idea and and he said um, they had many such ideas it was an HR startup but he was talking about how cross-industry 
you know, get intelligence is now seeping into HR systems. Okay, and let me give you an example. Have you heard of uh, uh, driver fatigue uh, alertness in in some of the high-end cars? Right, uh, Mercedes, BMW, Audi, and some of the other you know high-end cars have uh, this thing called as a driver fatigue warning system. Right, so how does that happen? Do you know? So there's a small camera on the uh, on the rear view uh, which is observing the driver and it is observing the eye movements and when you are about to go to sleep your eye movements are not that fast your your blinking reduces your breathing stabilizes and your that that camera is able to monitor all of that and it suddenly warns when they when it feels that a driver is about to go to sleep or is about to doze off on the steering it will warn you it says take a coffee break you know it is a coffee sign will come up and and it will start sounding all the uh, different cars have got different alarm systems uh, but that's fantastic, right? I mean, and, and who would have thought that that kind of a technology can come into HR as well? So now, what that startup company was trying to do is that get that algorithm, get that thing, and put it in the laptop cameras as well to try and see, not necessarily to monitor how your, you know, what what work the companies are doing or what work your, you know, workforce is doing, but to try and see how, at what point in time are you most active? What at what point in time is your workforce most active? Is your workforce overloaded? Right. I mean, so for example, if the certain sect of the population is is uh, working late nights and certain uh, you know population is not, then you can uh, you know very safely assume that you know it is skewed towards uh, you know this this part of the population is working really hard. So there are many such meaningful decisions that you can make if you had this kind of a technology there. But but my the, my point is that we all knew that this kind of a technology existed in the automotive space for the last five six years, but nobody would have thought that you know we can bring that to to HR HR space and look at workforce management look at uh, you know employee time and attendance that how how uh, you know active are you throughout the day are there times when you are least active and so on and so forth so that's just one example of uh, how technology is getting leveraged across industry segments not to mention that uh, you know i'm sure all of you have heard about deep learning machine learning and this and that and, and that's coming into uh, that is coming into and seeping into our workforce so fast that by the time you are there uh, you will be surprised that variables will be uh, a, a norm by the time you enter the workforce and i'm i'm talking about uh, n next two years if you are in the first year uh, first sem now but by the time you all of you have almost 5 years of uh, or 5 years of experience everything uh, or, or a lot of the things will be automated including time and attendance which is a, a big thing now we have a time and attendance product Every payroll company, every HCM company has a time and attendance product. I think they, that's going to vanish away very quickly because everything is going to be, your attendance is be, uh, will be through wearable. Your health will get monitored through your wearable devices. Accenture, when, when I was in Accenture, Accenture was developing a vest, uh, you know, which people could wear. Uh, and, you know, that vest will tell you, you know, how your, all your vital stats will, will go through a doctor almost on real-time basis. Also, you know, depending on how your blood sugar level is, if you're a diabetic patient, the blood sugar through patches can be administered. Um, so anyway, so we are talking about higher levels of technology seeping into everyday work. And what that will mean is that HR will have to undergo a huge change and we have to embrace that change and, and uh, you know, kind of move on and think how does that, uh, you know, radically, um, you know, how that radically kind of impacts our service delivery. So, and, and which it will, by the way, okay. Uh, integration of talent and technology. This is what I was talking about. People need not be afraid that technology is going to over, uh, you know, over, over, uh, uh, overtake them or supersede them. I think if anything, technology is going to uh, enhance and augment uh, people capabilities. I think it will only make people's capabilities even more stronger, even more richer. So I think technology, um, you know, if, if there's anybody who's thinking that technology is going to be harmful, I think technology is going to be useful in more than one ways. Uh, it is only going to augment your capabilities and I think that's the spirit that in which we need to take it. Uh, at least in HR, that's that's the spirit that we'll have to, you know, kind of uh, shared values and culture, cognitive recruiting. Um, there, there's a there's a change that is happening in recruiting by, and, and this, is, this is how HR is reacting to the changing world. We are not recruiting for a position these days. Uh, you know, you are just looking at the general intelligence of uh, of people and saying, listen, he can, this person is smart enough, is cognitively intelligent enough to take on any of the many roles that we have. And therefore, let's take him for that. Not necessarily that he's a Java programmer. No, this guy is good. Uh, you know, he's got a good brain. So let's take him and then we can train him on multiple other things. Or he can become, you know, he can, uh, depending on his own likeliness, likeliness for uh, or liking for a technology, he'll possibly be able to do better on that. So you are hiring not necessarily for a skill, but you are generically hiring smart people. 
Uh, and that's what Google does. I don't know how many of you know, but Google's interview process is very, very different. And it's been like that for, for many years. Although they would be hiring you for a particular position, but they will look at general intelligence. That are you, are you a well-rounded, uh, you know, cognitively available person? Which means that, you know, your ability to grasp and take on new things is possibly higher than somebody else. Um, and, and therefore, and that, that's what um, many of the companies are, you know, today doing. Uh, there's a huge need for transparency within the organization. All the millennials, uh, people who are entering the workforce today, uh, one thing is for sure that they, they don't, uh, you know, they don't believe in hiding information or they don't believe in, you know, just keeping the information to themselves. Their transparency is really, really big on them. And, and therefore, that's something that, uh, you know, HR today is trying. It is trying to make organizations as transparent as possible, uh, which means that, um, you know, goals are being driven top down more quicker. Uh, you know, goals are also being driven you know, down upwards, uh, and and that's more acceptable. You know, people are wanting their leaders to be more communicative. Uh, you know, strategies need to be known right up to the the to the you know bottom of the pyramid and so on and so forth. So that's that's what I mean from a transparency standpoint. Empowered teams. I spoke to you about uh, how you know these agile teams are you know working today. They have the they have a direct line of communication sometimes to the CTO. Uh, you know, bu organizational bureaucracy is getting absolutely uh, cleared. Um, you know, so these empowered teams have the ability to reach to the CEO uh, on a day's notice. If in a in a brick and mortar company like John Deere, try try reaching out to the CEO. Uh, it will take you possibly months to get on a calendar. But now things are very different. Things are different in the sense because we have these empowered teams. We are talking about agile squads who have a direct line of communication to the CTO, CEO, or the product or the C suit of uh, you know uh, of people. One email and they are available to you. So so that's the that's the nature of. And that's the, you know, that's the way uh, HR is kind of adapting to these changes. Very quickly then, uh, tapping skills anywhere, anytime. This is, the, this is the mobility of talent that I spoke to you about. You know, if you have a very good position and the person, the right person that you think is in Finland, uh, I don't think companies are, uh, you know, hesitant any longer in making that person an offer to say, listen, you can work from anywhere. You know, if you're in Helsinki, great. This is the this is the, the you know this is the job that I have to offer and I think you are the you know you are best suited even though I am in Pune and you are in Helsinki doesn't matter uh, and we very recently hired somebody for our HR strategic planning somebody who's going to be operating from Shanghai and this he's operating from his own they, we don't have an office in Shanghai but he is going to be leading our HR strategy and planning in Shanghai he's never gone out of China but I think that's the you know and he was he was possibly the best person that that uh, you know we decided was was very good. And, and that's how it is. You know, you might think that the strategy person will have to be in the US because that's where our largest base is, but not, but not necessarily. Thank you for educating us. We all are delighted with your presence.